When he awoke, it was pitch dark. Dark as the pit, dark as the tomb, dark as the grave. A thick, black, velvet darkness that seemed almost intangible in its intensity. The kind of darkness that got into the pores of your nose. Trinkle did not possess a legal mind. He was a mental grasshopper, an intellectual kangaroo, a mind wallaby. The gray voice of the gray Seaforth slid grayly on their ears like a tide of putrescent gray molasses. Everywhere was dark, dark, darkness, blackness, black, black, blackness. He examined his slate. Blood? Blood. Crimson, copper smelling blood. His blood. 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 And bits of sick. Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe was possibly the most prolific science fiction writer of all time. He has some competition for this title. Isaac Asimov, who once said that his compulsion to write was so strong that it might call for psychiatric treatment, is widely claimed to have written or edited around 500 books. But that or edited adds a very big asterisk to that list. And along with compilations that were only partially written by Asimov and revised editions of previous novels, some people estimate that the actual number of full original novels might drop as low as 41. And Asimov's writing career lasted about 40 years. Fanthorpe's science fiction career lasted only 15 years, during which he wrote, by himself, roughly 200 different books. It's difficult to be sure of the exact number because he used a lot of different pseudonyms, many of which were also used by other writers who worked for his publisher, and considering how fast he cranked out books, not even Fanthorpe himself probably remembers them all. He also wrote 89 of his books in a span of just three years. That's 158 pages every 12 days, consistently. Presumably, he slowed down after that because he experienced some burnout. 158 pages every 12 days might seem difficult and stressful, but possible, but it's important to note that Fanthorpe was also not a full-time writer. He was working as a full-time teacher at the same time he was cranking out novels at this breakneck pace. So how exactly did Fanthorpe accomplish this, and why do you aspiring writers probably not want to follow his example? Do not read too much Lionel Fanthorpe at one go. Your brains will turn to guacamole and drip out of your ears. Neil Gaiman The first step to a Fanthorpe novel was his publishing company Badger Books contacting him with a piece of cover art. Then, together, they would come up with a title. Then Fanthorpe would go home and do a little thinking about the story. But just a little. After all, he had a deadline. And then he would pull out his tape recorder and start narrating. Once he filled up a tape, he would send it to a transcriber to type it up. Then, after a good night's sleep, he would call the typist to find out how many pages his narration had filled up, get a quick refresher on where he'd left off, pop a new tape in the recorder, and narrate more. Repeat the process until the book is complete. So actually, maybe it's not fair to call Fanthorpe the world's fastest sci-fi writer, because he didn't technically write all those books. Maybe he should be called the world's fastest sci-fi narrator, or the world's fastest sci-fi dictator. No, those both mean different things. Fanthorpe's unique approach to book production caused a few quirks in his novels. Because he was coming up with the plots, stream of conscious, over multiple sessions, with basically no editing or rewrites afterwards, and because he didn't even review all of what he'd previously narrated before starting a new session, sometimes he'd forget things in his own story partway through, and these things would never be caught or corrected. For example, a character who had previously been killed off would return later in the same book with no explanation, because Fanthorpe had forgotten that that character was supposed to be dead. I think it's very nice of you to give that dead woman another chance. Sometimes a typist would copy down Fanthorpe's narration wrong, probably not helped by Fanthorpe's tendency to make up words. Probably the most infamous, um, cork that resulted from Fanthorpe's writing method was caused by book length. Fanthorpe had strict page requirements he had to meet for all his books, but because of the way he was, uh, writing them, it wasn't possible to plan the stories to be the correct length. So when a story was getting too long, Fanthorpe had to wrap things up. 
This led to his most famous literary invention, the Flaz Gaz Heat Ray. In his book The Intruders, Fanthorpe had just gotten to the climax, where the heroes were facing down a fleet of evil alien dinosaurs, when he learned from his typist that he only had eight pages left to finish the book. So Fanthorpe introduced the untested experimental Flaz Gaz Heat Ray, which incinerates the entire enemy fleet at the push of a button. It's bad sci-fi cheese placed as straight as it gets. Bounce a graviton particle beam off the main deflector dish. That's the way we do things, lad. We're making shit up as we wish. Less well known, but equally worth noting, is how Fanthorpe would deal with a story being too short. That's when you'd get passages like this. She screwed up the securing diagram and was overwhelmed by a sudden desire to clean her teeth. It became the be-all and end-all of existence for a few seconds. The desire to clean her teeth grew absolutely compulsive. She could have no more resisted it than she could have flown unaided between two planets. Moving quickly from the radio to her live quarters, she squeezed a little water into a plastic container and put a few dabs of toothpaste on her brush. She slipped the brush into her mouth and pressed the small button in the end which activated its electric motor. The bristles, soft, gentle bristles, guaranteed not to damage the enamel or the gum, moved swiftly against the teeth. You get the idea. He put in an agonizingly detailed toothbrushing scene. Other things that were inserted would be characters lecturing other characters on history or philosophy, whatever could pad out a book and complete its page length. So why did Fanthorpe write like this when it made his book so, uh, special? Why did he sacrifice quality for quantity when he could have just taken some more time and maybe written a couple dozen books that had fewer errors and better plots? Well, there was a method to the madness, and it all relates to how the writing business worked during the time Fanthorpe was writing sci-fi. The publishing industry was very different in the 50s and 60s than it is now. There was no internet. Television was relatively new and had a limited amount of content, and printing was as affordable as it had ever been. There were large numbers of people of all ages who saw books as a source of light popcorn entertainment rather than something more highbrow. Combined with a lack of easy access to book reviews, it was a lot more feasible to run a publishing business for fiction that focused on quantity over quality. This was pulp publishing the mass production of genre fiction strictly as product, pumped out as cheaply as possible to try to make a profit. For writers, it was a time of usually low pay, but a lot of opportunity to get your work out there. And some writers did manage to rise above the rest to become literary titans, men like Robert E. Howard and Michael Moorcock. Most, though, were lost in a sea of obscurity. For no-name writers, which was most of them, book covers were king, because not only were people judging books by their covers, cover art and titles were often all they had to go on when making buying decisions. That's why Badger Books was prioritizing cover art and book titles over actual story. In a way, it was like trying to find the right tag or thumbnail to crack the YouTube algorithm. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Speaking of Badger Books, they were in many ways a typical pulp publisher of the era, a printing shop run on a shoestring budget with only three regular employees. They tried to get one book published each month in each of their respective genre fiction categories, which included westerns, crime dramas, war stories, and sci-fi. What made Badger Books unusual is that most of their books were written by just two writers. One of these men was, of course, Lionel Fanthorpe, and the other was a man named John Glasby. Glasby possibly wrote even more stories than Fanthorpe, although once again, every book he wrote hasn't been tracked down. Unlike Fanthorpe, Glasby specialized in westerns, hospital romances, and above all else, World War II stories. While I do think it is a bit more work to come up with a setting completely from scratch like Fanthorpe did so many times for his sci-fi stories, Glasby was clearly no slouch in the speedwriting department. Unfortunately, unlike Fanthorpe, there's very little information about Glasby available online. I couldn't even find a confirmed picture of him. Most of Fanthorpe's books were one-shots, with settings and characters that were never used again. 
But he did have two recurring characters who appeared repeatedly over a couple dozen short stories and novels. Val Stearman, a strapping newspaper man who started off skeptical of the supernatural, and Lenoir, a Cleopatrine, as Fanthorpe liked to describe her, psychic who might actually be a thousand-year-old immortal. Together, they investigated spooks, demons, and other occult nasties, time-traveled, and even went to outer space. Because while Val and Lenoir primarily appeared in Fanthorpe's supernatural story collections, they also crossed over into his sci-fi stories on numerous occasions. Clearly, these two were Fanthorpe's most beloved creations, and for good reason, as they're actually self-inserts of a sort. Fanthorpe signed a letter to a fan with Warmest Wishes Lionel, alias Val Stearman, and Patricia, alias Lenoir. Peltoro.com, a website dedicated to Fanthorpe's Badger books writing, has a whole collection of Val Stearman and Lenoir stories available for free for anyone who wants to check them out, including the infamous novel The Intruders with its infamous flas gas heat ray. As for Fanthorpe himself, he's still around. Although he hasn't written a sci-fi work since 1967, he wasn't done with the media business. From 1997 all the way to 2016, Fanthorpe worked as a television presenter for religious programming, he is a reverend after all, and shows about the supernatural. And in 2019, Fanthorpe got back into writing, but not sci-fi. His main output has been collaborations with his wife, once more focusing on supernatural phenomena and real-life mysteries. Things like UFO sightings and voodoo. Even now, Fanthorpe keeps the spirits of Val Stearman, Lanoir, and those little green men alive. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe to see more, and comment to share your own thoughts down below. You can also follow the other channels on Rumble and BitChute, where I try to have videos uploaded a little early. And you can check out my sci-fi webcomic, The Last Night of Elder, all linked in the description below. Thanks everyone, and have a great day. She began with the top left molars, worked round to the bicuspids, and came round again from them to the incisors, the canines, the laterals, and the centrals. Once she had reached the front of her mouth, she changed her grip on the brush so that it moved round to the top right, traveling over the bicuspids and molars as it moved. Coming down the sides of her teeth, she paused and took a deep breath, placed a little more paste upon the brush, and moved it round again, this time beginning with the actual chewing surface of the upper right molars, coming round and cleaning again between the crevices until she had worked round to the left molars. Once more, she put paste on the brush in this same elaborate ritual and concentrated her attention, now upon the inside of the upper left molars, the inside of the upper left bicuspids, round across the incisors, and so back to the right hand masticators. She rinsed the brush, reapplied the paste, and repeated the whole ritualistic process with the lower teeth. She cleaned the brush very carefully, and then in a set way, put it back and moved back towards the radio set. She had taken barely a dozen paces when she was assailed by a horrible thought. She had not cleaned the top left inside molars.